So I'm going to be talking today about the field of brain-machine interfaces, and I will try to make a summary of where are we today in the field and what are the, the hurdles that remain in order to bring this technology all the way to the clinical realm, which is mostly where we focus on. I will start with two examples of very successful uh, neurotechnology devices, implantable devices, and I'm starting with this slide because, as you will see, we work in the invasive side of brain-machine interfaces, or BMI. There are other ways, non-invasive ways, like EEG, etc., that I will be not talking about today. So there are two very, very successful examples, in particular the flagship of the field, which is a, a cochlear implant that allows people that lost hearing to, re to regain hearing even at different stages in their lives, like childhood or adulthood. Um, the other one is a more recent one, uh, which is the DBS, so Deep Brain Stimulator, that allows people with uh, Parkinson to basically uh, reduce the tremor in cases where drugs don't work anymore. Um, and again, these are very invasive, especially as you can see in the case of uh, the, the DBS, it goes all the way to the subthalamic nucleus. This is an electrode implanted all the way deep into the brain. So it's, this is a safe technology, and uh, it's only going to get better, as we'll see later today in the talk. The purpose of our work is centered around sensory motor control or to how to help people with uh, sensory motor disabilities. And in particular, in this case, you see uh, Christopher Reeve with spinal cord injury, but this also is meant to help people with stroke, ALS, and so on. There are huge numbers of patients in the U.S. alone that suffer these conditions, and the field of BMI emerged primarily with this application in mind, basically to convert thought into action. Okay, so in this... Uh, block diagram that you see here, uh, we summarized the main elements of this uh, BMI loop, as we refer to it, in which you can see that there are a different variety of signals uh, extracted from the brain, non-invasive, as I mentioned, like the EEG, or all the way to the individual activity of cells in different areas of the brain, which is what we, we use in our lab. Um, and then this activity is streamed into um, uh, what we call a decoder, or a transform algorithm that translates the activity from these cells or groups of cells into certain motor commands that allows basically the, the subject to, for example, control a computer cursor in the screen, like a mouse pointer to reach and click, or a, a, to steer a wheelchair, and obviously still in the early stages of development, but, uh, but being the ultimate goal uh, to control a whole body or upper limb, etc., exoskeleton devices and orthotic devices as well. We refer to this block also as the spinal cord for prosthetic function, mostly because, as you can see, it, it subserves the role of the spinal cord in this now modified central nervous system, right? It's projecting a large number of signals okay, into a, a subspace of, in this case, motor commands like position X and Y of the endpoint effector or the computer cursor in a in similar way or analogy, analogous as how the real spinal cord obtains signals from thousands of neurons and projects those into, let's say, a dozen or a couple of dozen of muscle groups just to move the upper limb. So let me show you. This is uh, the early days of uh, BMI, uh, around 2002-2003. Uh, I was a postdoc at the lab of Miguel Nicolelis, who is one of the pioneers in the, uh, in the field of modern neuroprosthetics. And then um, and, uh, on, those, on those days, we were actually trying to close the loop for the first time, you know, and showing that uh, macaque monkeys, in this case, we, uh, in the absence of physical movement, could drive the neural activity to control prosthetic devices. So in the top, you see uh, a macaque monkey controlling a computer cursor to reach for this target and in the absence of physical movement, so that's the arm they used to control a joystick not resting there. You see here another macaque controlling a much harder task, this robotic arm to hit also the target, and this is another, this, the same macaque doing a reach and grasp task. In these cases, even though you see some re residual arm movement, this is all under neural control. So the signals from the brain are entering that decoder, and the output of that decoder is rendering the screen, and the animal sees that. So those were the early days of closing the loop, going back to 2003. Uh, where are we today, especially in the human front, right? So, as I mentioned, the goal, or one of the goals of this field is to translate this technology into the, in the, into the clinical realm. So, um, it's fair to say that there are two main challenges or bottlenecks to have this as the pacemaker of the brain, okay? And I have divided them, one, in anything related to what, to what is inside the brain, meaning the implantable device that my colleague Michel Maharis will be talking in a moment. And challenge number two, 
anything else that you can do with those signals, assuming you can keep them for decades or a lifetime, which is one of the main issues about why this technology that you can see is bulky, tether, and it's not wireless, uh, lasts for a few years only. So as a proof of concept, it's very good. And the same happens with the demonstrations that we have seen so far in the few clinical trials in the Brown and Pittsburgh groups. This is very exciting for our field, but we like to look at this like a half bottle. The bottle is half empty or half full, right? So it's very exciting, but at the same time, it's not enough to call this the, the, the level of skill that we like to do in, 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 in the, in, to achieve in this Be My Field, to perform tasks of daily living, like brushing your teeth or tying your shoe or whatever. Um, one more thing, the, uh, however, the field of uh, uh, robotic actuators has uh, advanced uh, tremendously in the last year. So you can see these are fancy prosthetic and orthotic devices built through DARPA programs and also a corporate in the corporate world, and mainly you can see that there are huge numbers of controllable degree of freedom. So it's fair to say that the, these robotic te technologies exceed the capacity for BMIs to control them. In other words, we don't know what to do with our BMIs in, to, to exploit the full possibility of these robotic actuators yet, right? So there's a little bit, little bit of a mismatch, and, uh, and hence we're focusing our attention in, in the brain, how the brain learns and adapts to control to, this de to control these devices, right? The process of uh, basically cortical plasticity was mentioned before earlier this morning. So in the last four or five years in, in my lab in Berkeley, we have been focusing about the problem of plasticity, of uh, how the brain incorporates the prosthetic device into neural representation. So for us, it's very important that the brain owns the device. So in order to achieve eventually a natural and skillful control of the device, as opposed to the decoder learning or the machine learning everything about what you are trying to do, which we think is important. I will mention that in a moment. But, uh, but, but, but we start from the premise that the brain has to learn and incorporate that device into its own representation, like an extension of the body scheme, if you like. Think of this like a very primitive or, uh, yeah, or early version of an avatar, where we, we're going to be talking about a computer cursor. Okay, so uh, what, what we hypothesize is that by keeping the BMI loop stable in the sense of connecting the same channels, the same neurons, to the same decoder from day to day, and, and hence keeping the same BMI circuit from day to day, the, the subject, in this case the macaque monkey, will be able to recall, um, retain what is learning a given day and recall it readily in the next day and so on. Like in the same way we recall motor memories, like when we learn to drive a car and then we jump in the car and we drive, we don't need to recalibrate and so on, right? That's the concept of the motor memory, but in this case, in a, in a neuroprosthetic sense, a, a motor memory for something that does not belong to your own body, right? It's a disembodied actuator. Uh, in this animation that we just saw, this is a macaque monkey performing what is known as a center out reaching task um, that requires the animal to drive the cursor purely under neural control and doing this in the absence of any physical movement, so it's just mental control, to the center target to hold for 400 milliseconds and then reach one of the eight targets that you see there, in which case the animal gets a juice reward. Uh, so this is a demonstration of efficient 2D control, like reach and click, that you can do with a bunch of cells in a macaque monkey, right? Just to give you a, a sense of a, where we are now today. And needless to say, this uh, performance uh, doesn't need recalibration from day to day. After the learning phase, the animal from the very first trial in a given day can recall that, this uh, plug and play effect if, that we like to call. We have been talking about adaptation here in the brain, brain plasticity, but then there is the possibility, obviously, of also use machine learning techniques to, to improve or to change the, the parameters in the decoder, in this spinal cord for prosthetic function, in order to, for example, accelerate learning, boost performance, and so on. So this is a, an, area, an area that we're exploring these days, which we call, or people call, a co brain-machine co-adaptation, because now it's a two-learner system. You have the brain and the machine learning in the same closed loop. And it's tricky because, for us, it's very important that we do not give up the plas plastic property properties that we mentioned a moment ago, right? We want the brain to own the device, but at the same time, we want to help or imp you know, improve performance by tweaking the parameters of the decoder. And I will not get into details on how we can do that, but basically, this is becoming now a, a very promising uh, area for, I mean, um, of research in, in BMI. So the summary of my part of the talk, which is, has been about what to do, challenge number two, what to do with the, with the signals if we could keep them forever, okay? I would like to mention, so 
what we are pointing towards is the skillful natural control of the BMI. So, and notice I mentioned natural control, so you want to feel also the BMI. And so far we haven't been talking about sensation, but that's one of the, the big missing elements in, in this BMI field that us and many other groups are also pursuing, but this, I will say, a little bit more underdeveloped than the, than the motor control part, which is to sensorize the prosthetic device, so to, to, to return this feedback to the patient so that it can feel the tactile information, for example, from the robotic uh, hand, from the gripper, and get also a sense of proprioception of where the robotic arm or a prosthetic device is in space, and so on, right? And doing that by writing in information in the brain, either by electrical or optical techniques like uh, microstimulation or optogenetics, for example. So that's uh, one of the main uh, uh, building blocks that people are working today and that we think is that it will uh, improve enormously what we see today as demonstrations of performance. Yeah, and with this, I will pass the torch to oh, um, get it. my colleague, right. Michelle. So my job <clears throat> is to give you a tutorial or an appreciation for the challenges in building uh, the gadgets that are required to do all the fantastic stuff that, that Jose was talking about. And I want to uh, end with uh, sort of a, a presentation of an idea that, that we're pretty excited about. So let me start. Let me start by giving you, uh, given the time, about a minute tutorial on how these technologies work and how do they take data from the brain. Let me start by saying there's a lot of ways to take data from the brain. And you should look forward to, with this summer, a number of really amazing white papers looking at the fundamental limits of how you would extract data from an entire brain, for example. There are many modalities, there are many different energies that you can use to, uh, to, to, uh, to take data out. Let's focus on what's called extracellular uh, electrophysiology. So in this, is, this is sort of the classic way Way, you take electrical information out of the brain very invasively and, and you get high resolution, if you will, data. So let's pretend this is an accurate representation of a neuron, which it is not. It just looks pretty. It's a big audience, so you've got to have things that look like this. So basically, you, you have a neuron, and this neuron uh, it fires depending on the input it's getting. And uh, it turns out that when it fires, it, it changes the concentration of ions very rapidly around it because it's using those ions to fire. And so there's a very classic method that's, that's you know, revolutionized things um, many decades ago, which is you put an insulated wire such that the tip is close to this neuron. Close means about 100 microns, although people will debate this. And you measure the potential between that and some distant electrode, which is usually some other piece of metal in your head, not near the neurons you care about. So by recording these signals, uh, you can essentially infer something about the activity of those neurons. And that's been the basis of, of the type of work that you see, that you, you take these recorded uh, electrical signals and then you, 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 make, you do things with them. Now, there are challenges to doing this for the type of things we're all talking about here. In other words, lifetime chronic uh, integration. And so um, what do you want when you want one of these technologies? Well, you want to make sure you get whatever part of that electrical information is relevant to you. So that might be spikes. You might want to see little actual spikes, as, which represent the neurons firing as a sum total of the activity that's going on. Sometimes you'll, you'll just be interested in what's called multi-units, a lot of different spikes, or, or local field potentials, which are not really any individual neuron. You're just happy to hear the cocktail part going on. You're like, oh, I can do something with this sort of cocktail party. You want to see as many as you can. You want it to last a long time, right? You, you want it to be biocompatible, which is a complex term that we can unpack in a minute. But the, the sort of quickest way to say it is you want to minimize the harm the brain does to the electrode and minimize the harm the electrodes do to the brain, right? Because you're putting this into a brain. You, you are very worried about infection because all existing systems go through the skull and stay that way. There are wires coming out of your head, which are very carefully worked on and closed up. And there's surgical techniques for this, but there is a wire going through your skull, a hole in your skull, to be precise. Uh, you want to minimize the amount of damage you do when you sort of staple this in the brain. And you'll see what I mean by staple in 30 seconds. And something everybody's going after is you'd love to do this with not you, you know, without you having some immense thing coming out of the back of your head. You'd like to be able to walk around and, and do things. And that's not just for cuteness. It's because a lot of science would be enabled if, if you could take all this, do all these wonderful things with completely awake, normal behaving animals. So these things, the state of the art looks like this. So th th this is the famous Utah array picture that sort of changed everything. 
uh, uh, more than a decade ago. And out of this type of work have arisen arrays that look like this and like this. And you can see that essentially they're bed of needles. And at the end is the exposed part that's going to record. And you stick all this in, and each of those needles is going to give you a recording. And so there are various incarnations of this that I'll skip. This one's made by NeuroNexus. Some of these are made by CyberKinetics. They're, they're different variants. This is the Duke array that uh, uh, Jose worked on with Miguel Nicolelis. And so they all, you can see a, a kind of a, a mo common motif, I hope, right? OK. A newer sort of approach to this, and these are not the only people, there's a, lot, a number of people, but here you have the same needle, and, and this is pioneered in Michigan, and this is a newer paper from another group. Lots and lots of little, these little, little dots, these little bright dots, each of them is like an independent head of a wire. And so this shank can take, in fact, lots and lots of recordings along. It's one millimeter long, 35 micron width. Each of those little gold spots is recording this electrical trace. Each of those lines is an electrical trace. Time is the x-axis, five milliseconds is this little bar. And you can see here, oh, there must be a neuron near this bundle here, because you can see all these little spikes, and they're correlated. That must be some, they're all picking up the same neuron nearby firing. That's a, a spike. OK, so this gives you an appreciation for what, what you want to do. But, but there are problems. And, and this is what, uh, what I want to do now. So I, I want to sketch out these problems. This is go, the debate going on in the field, and give you two different passes at what we're doing. The first one is a, sort of what I would call pseudo-conventional. And then I want to end with something we're very excited about that you're going you're to be hearing about, hopefully. So um, what are the problems? The biggest problem is these things just don't last that long. So, so infection is a problem, but, but you, know, you all can imagine that without much explanation, because the wires through your hole in your skull are the route for infection. Um, but the actual sites themselves degrade. And so in rats, they last proportionally longer for their lifetime. But in primates, essentially, there's, there's a very nice report from uh, at the end of the year that go, pushes this a bit up. But it, essentially, it's a small fraction of your lifetime uh, before these uh, electrodes do not give you useful information. Okay, they just, they, those lines just go flat. Each of those little sites stops showing stuff. And there's a big debate in the community as to why. So is it that the wires themselves are allowing infection to go in very slowly, and it sort of kind of goes in there and starts messing with things, because you know, you're talking about a brain? Is it that these, these needles are really stiff relative to the brain, and over time, this really you know, upsets what's going on there? One I didn't mention is, is it that when you, you go in there, you pop a bunch of capillaries, because your brain is as vascularized as it is full of neurons that this causes a problem? Uh, is it that, that they move, right? That they, this is very stiff and they sort of sit there and they're moving relative, as I go like this, <laughs> they're going <laughs> Maybe that's doing something over long periods of time to upset the, the, the cells. Is it that the surfaces chemically just don't look like brain? And so the cells are looking at this going, why did this skyscraper just land by me? You know, everybody attack! And they all just, you know, no one knows. This is a, a, big, a big deal. And so let me, what I want to do is sketch out in two slides and then, and then wrap up with something uh, different. Um, what, what we're doing, which is I think representative of what a lot of people are doing, you're probably going to hear more about this kind of stuff today and tomorrow. So, um, we, we're attacking this issue aggressively in a number of ways. So the first one is get rid of those wires. Uh, put a 60 gigahertz radio with the latest electronics technology inside your skull. And that 60 gigahertz radio will be, will be taking all of the data that's coming out of here, beaming it through the skull, very high bandwidth, pulling out all that stuff, some fraction of the, of the channels, some compression. You know, these are details, the technical details. And then this thing out here then talks to some other nearby device uh, and sends all, all the information it does. It could do some processing. It, it might itself, this small thing sitting on your head, uh, do some computation. The other thing a lot of people are doing, including ourselves, is attacking the stiffness. So instead of having those you what you have is you have, think of the contact lenses. Polymers as thin or much thinner than contact lenses lying conformally over your brain from which sprout almost like an octopus, very, very small, really, really small, uh, anywhere from a few microns wide, a little bigger, uh, also po com compliant polymer things that are inserted into the brain and left there. So you have almost this very thin spaghetti that's sort of permeating the cortex taking data. Okay? So th th this is something where these are some of the first ones to come out. You can see this flexibility there, this incredibly tiny thing, and it's connected to a prototype that's going to get much smaller as, as we work on this. So it should be reliable, tons of channels, and so on. This is just an eye chart. This is, I'm going to spend two seconds on this. But a lot of technological innovation is required for this. And, and this is not going to be something one lab is going to do. This is an effort over a decade. It's going to have to involve a lot of people looking at different angles of this. Just, just in my lab, which is you know, a, a small drop in the ocean, you can see all the different technologies that have to be developed, from high density uh, you know, assembly technologies that involve polymers and, and silicon and metal, to, to working out these little contact lens-like substrates I was talking about to record, uh, to the, the actual 
details of the engineering of the interfaces to insertion robotics. So this is beautiful work. Um, so Peter Lidohovitz has been doing a lot of this. He's here somewhere. And uh, Tim Hansen in Flip Sabi's lab in mine, working on, on robots that are literally have micron scale, almost stitching machines that will basically sit there and go and get these things inside. How do you get a five micron wide, one millimeter long piece of contact lens material in? It's a, not an easy, a trivial, a trivial uh, technological problem. So, so I want to end uh, real quick with something that I think will change everything. And we're very excited. So this is the next level. And, and we're pushing hard on this. You should see a white paper, open access, giving the entire engineering specification of this uh, very soon. So we call this neural dust. So the goal here is to have the transcranial transceiver, but now you don't have any needles in the brain. You have incredibly small specks, scalable down to the tens of microns, which are not using electromagnetic energy to couple to them, because it turns out coupling electromagnetic waves, sort of your usual cell phone radio, through a brain is, is a losing proposition for very small things. You're coupling out from these independent little specks uh, using ultrasound. Each one is a little tiny ultrasound transceiver uh, talking to a base station. And this base station can talk to, talk to a number of them. This would be completely untethered, completely embedded, recording what's going on in the brain and sending it out, sort of fairy dust at the top of your cortex, beaming out data to a collector, and then that gets sent out to the outside of the skull. So we're, I'm going to wrap up by saying we're very excited by this. This is the sort of uh, the, uh, the mental output of Jose Carmena, myself, Jan Rabai, and Alada Lawn, sort of this gang of four at Berkeley that's become obsessed with this problem. Uh, and look, look for a, a, a white paper very soon uh, with all the technical details it laid out in sort of uh, exquisite detail, because we really want to invite everybody to start working on these platforms.